That's not a comic book. Now that's a comic book. Hi everyone, welcome to Trade Talk. This week we're talking about The Unstoppable Wasp, Volume 2, Agents of Girl. I want to say thank you again to Simeon Scott, who sent me Volumes 1 and 2 of The Unstoppable Wasp. Uh, I've got one more book from him coming out next week on Trade Talk. Not Unstoppable Wasp territory, though, but that's fine. Uh, I do plan to, uh, like, I know this series has kind of been resurrected um, because the trades were selling really well. So I do plan to eventually track down the other trades because I did really enjoy this. So spoiler alert for, for this review, I guess. Um, though I will say, Volume 2 on some levels worked really, really well. On other levels, I thought was... A, like kind of backtracked a little bit and in ways that I prefer it wouldn't have but it was still well handled um, so we, we kind of pick up right where we left off in the, the last trade where um, Ying yeah Ying uh, Nadia's friend from the Red Room has a bomb in her head, and so Nadia is going to try to find out how to get it out. And she's calling in her agents of girl, who's this uh, this lab of genius girls from around New York, Marvel Universe's New York, to try to brainstorm a way to get it out in less than 17 hours or something like that. And so they all arrive. And it's a big dramatic thing, and they're all interacting with each other, and they're trying to figure out what they can do to get the bomb out of her head. Um, and they're kind of actually hitting it off and having a good time, and it's it's kind of like a fun sleepover, but with dramatic tension. Um, which is just, I, I, I really like this. this. This is immediately fun, but it's got like some cool drama behind it. Uh, and then there's like the big comic booky kind of reveal which they're called by their handler, who they call Mother, uh, who is running the, the Red Room and the science class, uh, which is the division Nadia and, and Ying were put in. Um, and so they're given an ultimatum. And I can only deal with one of my girls going away. So either Nadia, you come turn yourself in, or I'm blowing up Ying's head. And so Nadia... Uh, suits up and, and heads off and they try to kind of like come up with a plan and I just the thing I really like is this moment of Nadia kind of going away and immediately accepting um, you know accepting the how do I want to say this immediately accepting the responsibility um, even though it's, it's a you know sacrifice for her alright team here's what's going to happen Mother wants me to meet her at a rooftop in the city. We'll be airlifted out by helicopter. It's safe to assume she has one of the pin particle immobilizers that Ying built, so I won't be able to get away. I'm going to walk right up to her, and I'm going to turn myself over. I don't want any of you to try and talk me out of it. My imprisonment versus Ying's life, it's not a choice. What the rest of you are going to do is find a way to get that thing out of her head. I'm going to have an earpiece on. I'll buy you every last second I can. The moment you get that thing disarmed, you let me know if I'm still free, I'll run for it. I'm packing a couple extra provisions just in case you figure something out. And if this is the last time I, don't, I see you all, don't stop inventing. Don't stop being amazing. Keep girl alive. Oh, I really like that. Ah, it's a great moment. Just for such a nothing character, like I've, I, this this character really just oh it's Hank Pym's long lost daughter raised in the Red Room. That that really should not work. It should feel like a comic books kind of premise. But there's so much there's so much communicated in character building, character writing. Um, it just goes to show that any premise can work if you have a really strong character behind it. Uh, plots, complex plots and stuff are cool, but if you can't get invested in the characters, you, you're gonna have a hard time staying with the series long term. Um, and and so just seeing like you know this the situation with um, with Nadia, who's just this instantly likable character, and she's just as likable to us as she is to people on the street, is just so cool. And she's just such a 
it just feels so good, especially at Marvel, to have such just a genuinely good person. <laughs> Like, like Marvel's thing is is a lot of their heroes are kind of jaded, kind of, um, kind of, um, not nalistic, but, but kind of shitty. Uh, um, like, you know, every, everyone loves Spider Man, but but Spider Man, you know, Peter Parker was that kid who who let a, a robber go because it's not my problem. You know, it's it's no coincidence that everyone in Marvel is from New York, right? Like, there's there's something to that. Um, yeah. Uh, so anyway, I I like the design for Mother. It's really fucking creepy. Maybe borders a little bit on some tropes that are probably better off not being touched upon. But I'll give it a pass. I'll give it a pass on that because we're getting some pretty inclusive stuff otherwise like we've got um we got this multiracial uh young female crew and they've even included a, a girl who's um who's disabled so i'll give it i'll give a little bit of tropes of oh look what your madness has done to your body um i'll give that a pass in exchange for doing things well that don't play on those tropes in, in other situations. Um, so the agents of Girl uh, have to come up with a plan to get the bomb out of Ying's head, and they figure out how to do phase shifting using spare parts left in Hank Pym's lab um, that make up vision. And so they make gloves that can phase shift the bomb out of Ying's head. Uh, saving the day and allowing Nadia to escape, but Mother had a backup plan, and the agents of the Red Room are attacking the agents of Girl, planning to kidnap all of them, not just Nadia. Um, and I, I quite like that. It was pretty cool. Uh, Matt Murdock, who is Nadia's immigration lawyer, is able to show up as Daredevil and help kick ass. Um, and yeah. So it looks like the day is saved, but dun dun dun, Ying passes right the fuck out after everything is is hunky dory, and it does not look good. So then we get the next issue. Um, so that's all right. Hold on, let's let's figure this out. Comparing the size of comic book pages is probably my favorite thing that I do on this show. All right. So, first section, all told from Nadia's perspective, ends with Ying passing out. Next section of the book, all told from Janet's perspective. So it's about equal, I'd say. Maybe Janet's just a little shorter. Um... But yeah, from there we shift over to Janet, the the other wasps, uh, POV. And we get two issues of that. And I'm kind of fine with it, but at the same time, I really would have preferred Nadia. Uh, like, I just... I'm reading the series for Nadia. I like Nadia. I'm not, not interested in Janet's perspective, but the... You know, we you've already sold me. You spent... Six issues selling me on this really cool, upbeat, fun character, and now you've put her into a really stressful situation, and I want to see how she reacts to that. I want to see what what her her reaction is going to be, and I want to stay in her head for that. And then we shift over to Janet's, um, and she kind of, you know, has to help Nadia here and it's it's kind of crazy because Nadia's freaking out and she doesn't know what to do she doesn't know who to trust the ambulance comes to take Ying to the hospital but she doesn't trust him maybe they're spies for the red room uh, and Janet tries to tell her um give me just a minute we can follow the ambulance in my car and Nadia says that's not good enough they're spies they'll kill her or worse Nadia, these are EMTs. They're just going to take her to the hospital. Do you know that? Do you know them personally? I really like that. The idea that Nadia is just this really, really good person uh, who's just open arms, ready to love and hug and, and 
be the nicest person in the world to literally anyone. The second someone she cares about is in trouble, she can't trust anyone. She cannot trust a single stranger the second anyone's in trouble. The second someone she cares about is in trouble, she can't. She's, she's had a part of her damaged by her experiences. And I mean, if you'd been through something like that, how could you not? You know, I, shit, that's, it's a really tough kind of, kind of call to put her in. Um, and so Janet's trying to get her to calm down, but she grabs Nadia's arm as she's freaking out, and Nadia reacts without thinking and punches Janet. Poor Janet, all of her most important moments in comics just involve getting beat up. That's sad. <laughs> um, that's really sad. Uh, but I really like how Janet handles it. Um, you know, it's interesting. Nadia is of no relation to Janet whatsoever. She is Hank's daughter from a previous marriage. Both her parents are dead. Or better off dead, at least. Janet should have nothing to fucking do with this kid. And this kid just socked her in the fucking face because she's just freaking out. And it gives you a good sense of Janet's a really good person, too. Janet's the kind of person who can be understanding. Because she says, that was my fault. I should have known not to touch Nadia when she was in this kind of state. And more than that, Janet goes to the hospital, finds Nadia there, pinning down an orderly, and finally gets her to calm down. Knows how to help her cope with everything that's happening. And then she says, now tell me about all your problems. Let's see if we can fix a few while we wait. And so Nadia explains everything that's gone wrong since she last talked to Janet like two days ago. Um, and so Janet goes and starts making some calls, fixing some problems. I'll say this, um, <laughs> you know, you look at all the text, this is probably a little bit overwritten. Um, though to be fair, the important parts here are the the internal monologue, the dialogue here is more just like filler, uh, kind of just rounding out the conversation. Um, and I, I would say you could probably cut it and just show the art and it, it all still communicates, but I do think the writer here, uh, Jeremy Whitley, um, I think they do a good job of taking what could be just superfluous dialogue to fill space and time and making it into character building. I think you get a really good sense of the way that Janet interacts with people here, and I, I quite like that. Um, so yeah. But this, of course, is superhero comics, so we can't just have emotional growth. We need fighting to, to properly frame it. Uh, and so some bad guys show up to take Nadia and Yang and Janet and has to fight them and Nadia helps and yada 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 yada. Uh, turns out Ying is okay. She bursts out of the OR to help in the fight. I thought that was pretty fun, pretty cool. And then the, uh, the three of them go home and get tacos and stay up till 2 a.m. Uh, which is a really fun ending. And then the next issue is about Janet fixing all of the problems. She takes Nadia and Ying out and they go and they start just dealing with everything that's gone wrong in the last two days. And they get um, Nadia footage of Hank Pym admitting that he, you know, took some of his blood and put it in a tube. And then you get to see uh, Nadia's mother, Maria, right? Maria? 
Yeah, Maria. Uh, and, and Hank interacting. And that's really emotional for Nadia, but it also means that they now have DNA evidence that Hank Pym's... that DNA evidence of Hank Pym so they can match with Nadia, making her an American citizen, giving her a space in this city. And then they go to Pym Industries, or Pym Laboratories, and all the agents of girls show up. Um, and Janet reveals that they're giving them a lab. They they get this nice place with all these rooms that they can stay in if they're working on projects overnight. And there's a, even a lab mentor. Um, Barbara Bobby Morris, a.k.a. Mockingbird, joins to be the lab mentor because Nadia inspired her so, and she wants to help inspire other girl scientists in the Marvel Universe. And then it's all nice and positive and yay, and they're going to have a gala night to kind of celebrate the, the creation of the lab, and they're all going to get dresses, and that's cute and fun and, and quite adorable. Uh, but then Nadia overhears someone talking about how they can't believe Janet's doing all this for her, given that, one, she's not even her kid, she's Hank's, and Hank hit her. And that causes Nadia to start doing some research on parts of her father. And she just cannot fucking believe it. And she's devastated to find this out about her father. And this is probably the scene that worked just the absolute best for me in justifying... Um, I'm not justifying, that's the right word. Um, in cementing... Nadia and Janet's relationship because the next there's a scene shortly after this that really works as well but this one in particular really hit in a good place where uh, Nadia just asks um, I saw it on the internet I don't know how I didn't find out before it's everywhere why didn't you tell me he was evil and Janet you know, it gives a very realistic answer. Um, first, let's get one thing straight. Hank Pym was not an evil man. He did an evil thing, and he had to live with that. There's no excuse to treat a person you care about the way he treated me. How could you forgive him for that? Well, honestly, I don't know if forgive is the right word. I accepted what happened and moved on. And then, you know, Janet kind of talks about her experience with Hank um, and how Nadia should not be ashamed to be his daughter because he did something bad. Should not be ashamed, uh, should not feel guilty about that because she has no control over that. And for all his faults, Hank still did a lot of good and he created Nadia and she doesn't have to, to deal with the weight of Hank's mistakes. She can be the best version, the kind, the best kind of person that Hank Pym ever could have been. Actually, let me rephrase that. Nadia can be a better person than Hank Pym ever could have been. I think that's the important takeaway here. Um, so then we get seen a little bit later at the courthouse um, where Nadia is getting you know, official U.S. citizenship, and there's all this talk of paperwork. Um, and Nadia comes out and says, I have to ask you something. I had an idea that is really important to me, and you can say no if you want to, but I hope you won't. And Nadia, take a breath. Okay. The DNS, DNA t test came back, and it says I'm Hank's daughter. Nadia, that's great. Yeah, yeah, whatever. We already knew that. So... I had this conversation with Alexis, and we were talking about parents because both of her parents are dead too, and I said how I've never had a family, and she said that with the lab, it was like I was choosing my family, okay? They need to fill out a form for me, and I need a last name, but I've never really had a last name before, okay? And I thought, Pim makes sense, right? My parents' name, why wouldn't I choose that? 
except I never knew them, and I don't know what they were like, and my last name should mean something to me. And I could only think of one last name that meant anything to me, and it's Van Dyne, Janet's last name. But I wanted to ask you, because it seems like it would be weird if I just got your last name and didn't ask, or... And Janet just hugs her and says, yes, I'd be honored. And that, to me, is... This is such a, just an interesting relationship that, that has this feel to it of maybe this shouldn't... Like, not, not, let me rephrase that. It has this feel to it of everything in the world is against this relationship working and the personalities and the way these characters are written is just so genuinely overwhelming and and optimistic and deeply connected that it just works so well. I really, really love the character work in this book. Uh, if you ever need to give someone a good character study, you just throw this book in their general direction because there's a lot of a lot of groundwork that's done well with characters. Um, you know, I really like Volume One. Volume One is a really, really strong showing. You could maybe give someone Volume Two. Cold. I don't need, know if you need Volume 1 with how well Volume 2 is written. I will say, though, as much as I like this stuff, and I, I really like Janet's perspective on everything, too, I'd be, I'd be curious. I, I don't know. I just... Maybe the first issue. Maybe issue 7. But I'm not sure if you need... Issue 8 to be from Janet's perspective again. I think they both work, but part of me is a little bothered that we switched over. And and I think it would have worked a bit better to keep it from Janet's POV. Um, anyway, the, the story concludes with, um, with the girls in the lab testing uh, a teleporter, which is just the most Marvel thing you can do. And so they do a countdown and... End of the issue, end of the series. It's a really great, that's a, that's a great send off. Um, oddly enough, this is when this book got canned because uh, Marvel does this shit all the time. Um, that's, what can you do? Um, I really like that though. That's that's a great way to end the series in a very optimistic sense, uh, and like what comes next, what comes in the future, and of course the series got re-picked back up. Um, so yeah, I really did like that. Uh, also worth noting, this trade <laughs> follows suit with the first volume. This trade collects. Oh my god, um, a story that is a prequel in the back. <laughs> Uh, Tales to Astonish, number 44, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Battle of the Creature from Cosmos. And so this is the origin issue for Janet Van Dyne, but it also mentions uh, Maria Pym, um, Hank's first wife. So that kind of gives you the, the background for Nadia in a way, too. Um, Shadow Batman is in my live comments, and he says, what do you think of the art? Again, this is... Uh, this is pretty good. I, I do quite like the art in this series. Um, it's not like it's not quite to my taste. I'd say I I don't I don't typically seek out art like this that um, that looks kind of I want to say cartoonish, but that's totally wrong. I will say you could easily see something that's pretty akin to this be animated is, is kind of what I'm thinking. There's, It's got a simplicity to it in a good way. It's got a nice, like, bare-bones style. I mean, do I have the Green Lantern over here anywhere? Because, like, I love that book. Yeah, here. Okay. So here's a style of art that is to my taste. Uh... The Green Lantern number six by uh, Grant Morrison with Liam Sharp. 
upon art. And yeah, I, I really, really love Liam Sharp's art style. This is art that is to my taste. It looks really, really good and really, really cool. Um, I like this intense level of detail. I like this very, very highly rendered, very um, you know, just intricate kind of artwork. That is to my taste. This is the kind of stuff I can actually talk about and say like, you know, look at the hatching, look at the, the expressions, look at the um, really interesting character design and stuff. You know, I, I really like this kind of stuff and I can talk about this kind of stuff for days. Cool, great, yeah. Um, that's my personal preference. But something like this, you know, here's an action scene to give you like a cool sense of movement, like the the top here. Um, that's cool. I think that's the top. I fucking know Marvel characters for shit. Um, you know, you get cool looking stuff. Uh, I think the the composition work is good. Like I mentioned, this scene with Janet, I don't think you need the text that Janet's talking here. I think this scene works perfectly well. Uh, probably would make the payoff a little bit better in the next issue. Um, I think the scene works perfectly well without the dialogue. Um, this just isn't really to my taste, though, so I don't really have much to say on it beyond that. But it does really work for the series. The the expressions, the um, everything feels nice and cool. Um, and yeah, I, I dig it. I dig it for what it is, even though it's not really to my personal taste. That's kind of how I come out on it. Uh, so yeah. Really, really good series. Really good volume. Um, I, like I said, I will be eventually tracking down the, the next couple of volumes, um, though it's going to be a minute. <laughs> That's my two work through stack. I've got to stop myself from buying more trades. Uh, until I get through some of this stuff. It's just it's a little much. I'm, I'm going a little ham. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna eventually track down more stuff. But yeah, that's, that's what I got. Alright. <laughs> Sorry, RIP headphone users. <laughs> Alright. Yep, so I'll do it for a trade talk tonight. Everyone, thanks very much for watching. Until next time, bye! That's not a comic book. Now that's a comic book.